uh, private practice in a small town in 2003, providing family dentistry with emphasis on mercury-free restorations and minimal negative impact on, to his uh, patient's overall health. Throughout his career, he had discovered his passion for oral surgery. He routinely extracted infected teeth, failing root canals, and cavitation surgeries to help his patient to heal from these toxic teeth. Uh, before we start, please hold all your questions during the presentation. Write down all your questions and come back to the uh, 5 p.m. for the speaker's forum. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, if you guys would like, I do have some lollipops and pins, business cards back there. If you need to get a hold of me and forget to write anything down, that's all right. Um, so this is going to be kind of a quick little intro class, and if there are some stuff, I'll try to go a little bit in more depth as we get going here. Uh, okay, so here we go. Um, I said my name is Dr. Ben Sessions, and uh, accredited to IAMT, and uh, certified through IBDN, which is a good organization. Uh, this is my office. So this is right after we had the yard work done, and the paint job was cleaned up. So uh, a couple of hurricanes later, it doesn't quite shine that pretty anymore, but uh, it will here pretty soon. We get that cleaned up. Um, if you think you've seen it all, heard it all, just wait 10 minutes. I, every day I go through that, and I know how many of you guys have seen that. Something comes in the door, and you're like, what is that? How did that find me? How did that get here? How did they live with that? I don't know. Um, so just keep an open mind. That's that's what the, the big thing is here today, folks. Um, there's not enough biological dentists today that are doing any kind of biological oral surgery. There's a lot of dentists that are coming out of school that are doing dentistry. They're doing bad oral surgery. And if you're not doing oral surgery and you're sending stuff to them, you're doing your patients a disservice. Um, so if you're not doing oral surgery, I'd, I'd encourage you to start small, find a mentor, slowly increase what you do, uh, gain confidence, and then, of course, pay, pay it back, mentor others, and uh, help out your fellow biological dentists. Um, of course, help your patients, too, in your own bottom line. That's, that's, that's also important in there. Um, so who in here is doing oral surgery? Can you show of hands? Everybody's kind of doing a little bit. Some people need to do a little more. Okay. Um, who want to do more? Everybody about the same? Always can do more, right? Okay. Um, so this is just kind of an overview. Where are you um, and what you offer your patients? And PRF, ozone, prozone, silver nitrate, muscle testing, uh, iodine, hydrogen therapy is uh, one of the new ones I'm looking into, homeopathics, detox, sonotherapy, LED therapy, thermography, bioceramic, pulp caps, root canal removal, cavitation removal, oral airways, smart protocols, laser protocol treatment, the list goes on and on. Where are you in this pool? Are you down here in the shallow end or are you ready to get in the deep end? Okay, where are you at? I encourage each and every one of you to kind of start taking those next steps. We need more biological dentists doing biological surgery. Um, just remember, you're not alone. Um, the IOMT has a lot of good organizations to, to help mentor you and uh, connect with other dentists. So I uh, encourage you to do that. Um, with the increase of the corporate dental offices, dental chop shops, as we call them, the denture mills, uh, I'm seeing a lot of increase in, in demand for oral surgery. Uh, before, I saw a little bit, but as, as the years go on, I'm more and more. Uh, failing root canals, uh, cracked teeth that have been root canaled, and, uh, and the like. We see lots of that. Uh, we're called to do better, folks. We really are. Um, ancient Chinese proverb is good job requires good tools. Uh, that's my daughter and uh, one of our cows we used to have. And uh, she's taking some kind of a selfie. I never could get that lucky with a cow and a selfie. <clears throat> so this is... Uh, what I use is here on the uh, on the right side. Uh, it's, a, it's a different uh, design. Uh, these are from Carl Schumacher, um, the, except for the broken ones. Not that's uh, a dental school special. I think I got that off of eBay or something when I got started. Um, you know, honestly, folks, if you're gonna do a good job, you gotta have good equipment. You really do. Um, if you don't, uh, if you're on a shoestring budget like I've been most of my career, you need to kind of 
incrementally add pieces to your armamentarium so that you can do better work because it's 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 uh, kind of sloppy when your stuff falls apart when you put it down in the cabinet. And uh, I've been there. I know what it's like. So so slowly increase some stuff. Okay. Um, you can't do good dental work with crap instruments. Okay. Um, like I said, there's different makers out there. I use uh, different forceps uh, that are designed a little bit differently, and they work for me. There's different kinds out there. Uh, try some things out and see what works good for you. Um, the older style to me seems a little bit crude and barbaric. Um, to you it may not, but I encourage you to get out there and look around see what's out there. See what is available. There are nicer ways to do surgery now. We don't have to do it like the Civil War days, okay? Um, spoons and curettes need to be small enough to get down into the socket. Um, I have worked at other offices where they only have the one extra large spoon. You're not cleaning the socket out with that, guys. Um, that's only touching maybe the apical quarter. I mean, coronal quarter, excuse me. Um, if you can't get in and out and clean it out, you're not cleaning that PDL, you're not cleaning out the diseased tissues, and you really uh, can't get that cleaned out, then you're going to be useless trying to clean out cavitations. Uh, so these are pictures of some of what I've got here. Um, I've got different shapes, sizes, um, and uh, some of them are different lengths to get down in there. Uh, really depends on where you're at and, and what you're getting into. The larger spoons uh, really are going to be only for just an apical area or if you get a large area that has got a lot of granulation tissue. One of the things that I found a couple years ago is they have a, a serrated spoon. And if you guys haven't tried one of these out, um, they do have these available. I think uh, Mr. Jeff's got uh, some of these out there. And uh, those are really helpful. If you've got a really large cyst or some granulation tissue that's just not coming out of there, one of these things will work some wonders to get that gross stuff out of there for you. Main thing also, of course, is keep the patient safe. Um, there's lots of devices now that are available. Uh, we've got uh, the little screen there. We've got the isolite type uh, suction devices. Uh, on the bottom right, this is a new device that we found. It's called a laryngeal sponge. Essentially, it's a little sponge we put in there, especially for taking out third molars. It's really good. Sometimes that little net gauze trick, if you tried that, it works okay. But it, my assistant keeps liking to pull that thing out with the uh, suction and seeing if my blood pressure would go up any higher. So we're trying to get away from those. I don't know if you guys do the same, too. Um, this would help a lot if we could do this. Um, but, uh, unfortunately, we can't. So um, I know this is probably what you guys are thinking right now. That's, that's where we're at, okay? Um, we're all adults here, so we're going to have a good time. Um, everybody stand back. We're all professionals. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, patient case selection, anesthetic choices, uh, what I call control break versus a uh, suit up in a smart protocol, sectioning strategy versus four-step extraction, and normal extraction versus root canal extractions, removing PDL granulation tissue, abscess has got to purchase foreign bodies, etc. Um, also, we also look at everything too. We examine everything that's taken out. And if you guys aren't do that, I encourage you to, to do that. Uh, make sure you pay attention to what's coming out of there. And then we'll touch a little bit on biopsies, DNA testing, uh, pathology, MSA testing, uh, clean up irrigation, ozone, PRF, homeopathics, that kind of thing. Uh, we wish we all had this guy in our office. Uh, this guy has the world record for opening his mouth. That's pretty amazing. I don't ever seem to have those. I got the ones that kind of open just, eh. Okay, I need you, eh. That's it. Um, a lot of times we're not ideal. We'll do the best we can, okay? Um, but uh, always try to improve your techniques as best as you can. I get a lot of these patients. You want to do that to me? And I just kind of look at you. Um, a lot of patient education. A lot of explaining to people what's going on, why things are going wrong, especially when they've got a failing root canal. Uh, whether it's cracked or whether it's being rejected by the body uh, or it's non-restorable because of the frication decay that's got all three roots separated and the crown's kind of floating in space. Uh, it's always a fun discussion. Also look for uh, anatomical issues like a bifurcated inferior alveolar canal. Those are always fun. Um, and also where this uh, root canal is in relationship 
to that. Um, this is an older picture. Uh, we've since switched to 3D imaging. A lot of this stuff before I get in the middle of that, I'm going to have a 3D. If you guys don't have a 3D, that technology has come down a lot in price, and I really encourage you to, to really look into that. Um, got a picture in the NPR alveolar canal. Uh, this was a discussion I had with a patient that was a nurse. Is it worth digging into that? Or are you going to want to get into the middle of that? And if so, how are you going to get out? Um, after a lengthy discussion, we decided we didn't want to get in the middle of that. We got the best of it out we could. Um, washed it, cleaned it out, hose on the hell out of it, prayed over it, and we were done. So, uh, anesthetics. As a general rule, I use as little epi as possible. Uh, a lot of times I'm going to be using uh, non-epinephrine. Uh, uh, we got an epipocaine plane. This is just a generic at the top. Uh, Polycaine plane or sit nest are pretty readily available. Or block or septicane, they do make a 1 to 200k epi, which is half. Uh, some people, I'm amazed, still don't even know that exists. Um, you can switch over to this one pretty easily, and you're not going to have near the issues for healing. Another one we use is uh, this you get from uh, Medical Supply. I think I got these from Southern Anesthesia. It's a 0.5% uh, Marcane or Bupivacaine plane. You gotta draw this up in a syringe and then transfer that to your dental syringe if you choose. Um, you gotta be kind of careful with this stuff, but it does last a long time. If you've got patients that are like really long, uh, numb, this is a really good uh, option for you. That way you're not having to dope them up too much with the epinephrine, which interferes with your healing. So uh, this is a patient that we saw, and uh, the interesting fellow. Uh, nothing hurt. You know, they, they bring that to you. Nothing hurts. Doc, what do you mean you want to take this out of there? Um, you know, control break, that uh, premolar there had a mobility that was pretty floppy, so we just took that whole thing out. You don't always have to cut these things out in little pieces. I try to avoid cutting things out if I can because it just creates too much of a mess. And then you get all the debris in the socket, you get all the stuff in the gums, and you're the one who gets to clean all that up. So, uh, case selection. Uh, patients come in with perfect teeth, and so they look like, but you get in there and you start looking around. On, your, uh, on the upper right, of course, this patient had lots of medical concerns. We had uh, to do control breaks on several of these root canal crowns. Uh, I've got a 3D uh, there of a different patient. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, control breaks essentially is you uh, grab it with a forcep and you try to snap the crown off right below the right below the crown. So you take the crown and the amalgam buildup, which is often what's underneath this, out in one fail stroke. Sometimes you can also take a burr and you can cut uh, right below the crown a couple of relief marks and it'll make it a little bit easier to break that crown off and then you're going to go through and you're going to section the, the roots um, on all of these cases nothing came out easy uh, all of these were difficult and ugly the uh, upper right uh, mainly we focused on her were the uh, lower, pre lower molars and that premolar it's a failing root canal she had some calcified roots uh, when you had something like that, that calcification does not come out easily. That was a lot of ugly, a lot of uh, cussing and sweating on my part. So um, again, that was a control break. And then we sectioned the, the roots, took out a lot of interceptal bone, and then uh, took all that out. Those granulated roots did come out uh, with the granulation tissue still intact. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of that. And then, of course, we cleaned that out as best we could, avoiding that inferior alveolar canal, which I didn't want to get in the middle of. Um, the uh, lower picture there, uh, curly Q root, I'm sure you've all been through something like that. Again, this was another control break. And then after we got the front root out, we had to take out that distal root almost sideways. That was a really trying day for me. Um, just do some control breaks, you can try that. Other option, uh, of course, is going to be smart protocol. Um, I try to avoid this as much as I can. Sometimes you don't have much of a choice. And in this case, uh, we rubber dam isolated. She does have oxygen underneath the, the drape there. Remove the amalgam, and then I section the tooth, 
and I was able to actually do most of this extraction on the rubber dam. And if you have a sedated patient, that actually does work pretty well. If you guys haven't tried it, that might be something you might want to try. Uh, whether or not you remove the amalgam and then go through it, and you can just do a controlled break and then uh, section the tooth and take it out. But this works really well. In this case, the patient was snoring through most of the procedure. Uh, when you take out the tooth, make sure you check that thing out. Uh, this was a control break. Unfortunately, the control break didn't work the way I wanted it to. And we lost a little root tip down in there. Um, I'm not a big proponent of leaving root, tip, root tips and debris in the socket because that's infectious stuff that they're paying you to take out. And my, my thoughts are you need to do your best. Uh, the upper right one, this was a, uh, a young lady that was adopted into a U.S. family from China. And this is uh, some Chinese dentistry they did over there. And uh, she had a really large granulation tissue. I think it's kind of a bonus when that comes out. You don't have to go chasing that thing. But uh, mom and, and, and the patient were both uh, pretty amazed. Uh, that's a good thing to show patients when you can show them how bad things are. Uh, they clean up pretty nice. Many things you got to clean that crap out of there. This is my son. We were messing around in Walmart. And, uh, of course, the poop emoji dolls. You can sell anything in this country. That's what that's uh, telling me. Um, after you remove the tooth, uh, cure the socket, uh, clean it out until that cure comes out clean. Um, uh, we also do use a slow speed uh, hand piece at times to remove the PDL. Um, but we do have to use curettes either with thin bone or we're way down in there, curly key roots. You can't take a straight drill down a curved socket. Do your best. Try to get the granulation tissue, got a percha, form bodies, etc., out from the pockets and the sockets. Um, you should have solid bone everywhere, unless you have a defect, of course. Irrigation with sterile saline or sterile water and uh, with ozone. We're also doing x-ray verification to examine uh, these sockets now. We'll get into that in a second. Uh, these are liver clots. I don't know if any of y'all have seen these. Uh, patient was very unhealthy. Of course, he did not tell me any of that. Uh, his medical history review, and this came in afterwards. Uh, a lot of this we just had to let heal up. And uh, he, of course, couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. I tried to explain that he needed to take better care of himself. And he smelled like about 150 proof when he came in. Uh, probably what's causing some of this. Um, surgical burrs, uh, the ones we use uh, quite often are maybe six or eight round burr, straight 557L, or there's a hybrid now, which is a 1702, which is a, has a little bit of a round burr with a straight shaft. Uh, I've tried some of these skinny diamonds, these uh, single single use diamonds by Meisinger. Uh, I'll talk to, the, talk to you about those in a minute. They do work really well, just got to be very cautious with those. They come apart pretty easily. And there they are. They came apart on me in this case. That was not fun. Um, we took out the uh, uh, two teeth there that were infected. Uh, of course, the root decided to come out in lots of little pieces. We sectioned it and uh, took a post-op x-ray. And lo and behold, there are parts of my burr in there. So we had to chase those little pieces out of there because I don't want anyone else finding that. I want to find it and I want to fix it. Little pieces, little pieces, little pieces. Finally got them out of there. Okay, and the lower right's going to be a final post-op on that. You guys need to be very careful examining your burrs and make sure that stuff's coming out and leaving with you and not leaving with the patient. Such as that. Uh, thoughts? Who else taking post-op x-rays? Show of hands? Some? Not all, okay. Uh, I think this is going to be more and more important as, as time goes on with the age of litigation folks. Uh, this guy came in, he had uh, number 14 taken out by two different dentists uh, last previous fall. He came in, he had some issues over with two and three that were hurting him, uh, mainly because he's clenching and grinding. We couldn't really find anything wrong with that. And I took this pano and I said, uh, hey man, what's that? And he's like, I don't know. So we did a 3D. And that is a full-length surgical burr up in his sinus. That is not a happy moment, folks. You don't want that to be you. The downside to this is that he saw two other dentists, and they are arguing who left it in there. So that's between the lawyers and the dentists, and they're trying to figure it out because the oral surgeon's got to get paid, 
and the lawyer's got to get paid. And that's what the doctor's thinking right there. The patient is making angry eyebrows because he's pretty pissed. Patients, friends, and family are going to really start cracking down on this, okay? Um, yeah, that is my, my dog, by the way. My daughter thought that the dog was pretty emotionless, so put some little eyebrows on that thing. And yeah, I kind of cleaned, helped out quite a bit. I'm not sure if she was angry or not, but she was in that picture. Not all the time, more and more, I'm taking uh, post-op x-rays. Make sure that anything uh, is out of there. I predict that pretty soon I'm going to be doing this 100% of the time. PAs, panos, uh, 3Ds, whatever you're comfortable with. Most of the time we're taking PAs because it's right there. I want to get the patient up. Anytime I touch a burr to a tooth or to a socket, I'm going to take a picture from now on. Oftentimes these birds are coming apart. I don't know if it's just how they're made or what they're doing, but they're coming apart more and more often. This is a piece I dug out of a patient who came in. I took an x-ray and I said, hey, what's that? She's like, I don't know. That's the end of a burr. I would, uh, oral surgeon took that out wisdom tooth out when she was a teenager she's in her 40s now and uh, said hey we gotta get that out of there she said yeah I want that out of there so we got that piece out of there took a picture of it showed it to her x-ray follow up to let her know that it was all gone don't let this be you um, pre-op of course what are you getting yourself into um, again uh, it would be difficult on this uh, molar right here to be doing a controlled break. Uh, but as you can see, there's so much decay under there. I don't want this thing necessary to cut that crown off and, and dig all that stuff, expose that patient to all that mercury and stuff if you can do a controlled break. And then get that out of there. Of course, we got an amalgam that's kind of wedged between teeth. That was fun to get out to, by the way. Um, and then, of course, also got a percha. Uh, I, I don't know what's going on with these endodontists. I don't know how many of y'all are doing endo. Hopefully none, but uh, squirt it out the end of the root like a spaghetti straw. I don't quite understand how that is acceptable. Oftentimes I see it. It's shot out there, and I don't know if I'm seeing more and more of this or if I'm just lucky enough to see it. Why is this acceptable? Patients with latex allergy are very rarely, if ever, informed what got a part of it is. It is related to latex. It's got all kinds of junk in it too, folks. Excess gutta percha doesn't always cause root canal failure, but I do see a lot of it. Um, it's a pain to clean out. Real pain. If you guys aren't taking out root canals, you need to approach these with caution because they're going to come apart on you and it's going to be a pain in the butt to clean that out. Um, they break, they splinter apart. I charge a lot more to get root canals out because it's a lot more work. i got to clean the sockets out. I gotta get that junk out of there. And oftentimes that recur it requires a burr digging that junk out of the bone because whenever they squirt that out the end of the root, it doesn't stay right there. Oftentimes it'll penetrate the bone. You're doing a lot of bone removal, cleaning that out. Um, I do x-ray all got a perch removals now. And uh, like I said earlier about that inferior alveolar canal case, we don't get into that if we don't have to. Oftentimes your clients ask you to use cheaper. And uh, I told him no. Uh, before, when I was a little, a little more desperate, starving, running, I said, oh, yeah, sure, I'll do it as cheap as I can. Now, I, I do it as best I can, uh, and I give them a, a fee range. If you guys aren't doing a fee range, uh, you might want to think about it. It gives you a little bit of wiggle room. Uh, right now, I, I, I give patients about ranges on everything. I, I have the staff explain that to them. I don't discuss fees. I have my staff discuss fees because that puts me in a different position if I'm discussing fees. I'm now selling you something if I'm discussing fees instead of being on the clinician side of things. You all need to be in the clinician side of things. You need to be explaining the treatment and you need to shut up and get out of the way. Okay. Can you do it cheaper? Uh, well, there's a point where no, you can't. And that, that's hopefully why you're in my office or why you're in your office. And you saw I'm not in rural Texas, so I'm not... I'm not, I'm not on a, in a white castle. I'm not in a high castle. This is stuff anybody can do. Um, root canal removal. Took an x-ray of that. Made sure I got it all. It is the same patient. Just a different angle on the x-ray. Made sure we got all that cleaned out. And then we cleaned out the sock also. Uh, this is a gutta piece. Kept floating around in there. 
one piece and kept moving around, kept taking lots of x-rays to find out where that sucker went to. Finally got it. This is a piece of gutta percha that was actually shot out the end of the root. And it was up in there. We had to dig that thing out. So just a piece of, of course, that's clinically acceptable. They'll tell you got that, that, that the root canal specialist, oh, that's fine. That'll be fine. Just leave that in there. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. No one is sent to you by accident, folks. God intervenes. Uh, cavitations, uh, short version of this. Um, don't have a whole lot of time left. Uh, it's an area of the bone that didn't quite heal correctly. It's the short of it. May or may not be painful to the patient. Often the site of infectious tissue, scar tissue, necrosis, chronic tissue, uh, may be affecting the patient and their overall health. I send all of these for a biopsy now. If you aren't sending all these for a biopsy, you need to, to protect yourself and your patient because there could be something in there and you don't know what it is. And if you throw it out and you get sued later, it's going to be hard to, hard to defend yourself. So we we'll start with a 3D to evaluate the area. Um, a lot of clinical questions and discussion with the patient. Like I said, it's almost always wisdom teeth. Usually wisdom teeth, the lowers are more traumatic and they don't heal as well, especially if the oral surgeon is pumping them full of epinephrine. Uh, normal surgical protocol, we're going to create a buccal flap, create a little access window in the bone uh, with the surgical uh, round burr, uh, mainly enough to get a crevasse inside. I don't create a huge gap in the bone, that's just my personal preference. I don't go in there and try to create more surgical trauma. I curate the debris, send it out for a biopsy. And we cure out the cure out the area until we get solid bone or a clean MS MSA test and no more junk on the curettes. Then we ozone irrigate PRF and suture. Uh, MSA, I'm coming to that. It's meridian stress assessment. Okay. Um, this is my crude picture. If you can imagine this, we've got a socket, uh, kind of like a little beer can. We're going to go through the top and we're going to kind of get in there. We're going to clean that out. Okay. Going to clean all that stuff out that needs to go down the toilet. Okay. Sometimes when you get through that bony layer, that outside that cortical bone, you get through there, you put a spoon or a curette in there, that thing's going to sink. There's just nothing in there. It's hollowed out. It's granulation tissue. It's junk. It's bleeding. It has kind of an oily sheen to it. It's just a lot of nasty stuff. Okay. It's not always black and crude oil looking. Sometimes it's got some little oily looking droplets. Sometimes it's just yellow granulation tissue, red granulation tissue, just all kinds of scar tissue, okay. Um, we send these for a pathology. I send mine to UT Houston Pathology. I know there are several labs that, that do provide services. And I just tell them that's a, you know, a patient presents with a traumatic, you know, possibly traumatic uh, area of the bone that's not healing right. We clean that out, make sure it's nothing specific. Oftentimes we're not going to send you back much other than, you know, fibrous tissue, and a variable bone with atraumatic, atrophic bone marrow hemorrhage. They don't want to put their name on it, say so it's definitely a cavitation. The main thing you're trying to do here is to rule out that it's not anything worse than junk and scar tissue. Okay. Um, there are some, some people in, in the IOMT that have gotten into these and have found uh, metastatic cancers, other things in there. So you want to make sure that that's not what you're finding. And I tell patients that. I want to make sure that all this is is just junk that didn't heal up, scar tissue and the like. Um, predominantly viable bone with ischemic marrow changes consistent with chronic ischemic bone disease. Okay. Um, so no telling what caused this, but that, that's, that's kind of what you look for. You can look for kind of a, a report that's going to be pretty boring. Okay. Another thing, uh, and then, okay, um, ozone. Uh, we got an ozone in each of our oper operatories, well, ozone machine. We ozone every socket. Um, I've been told that Nevada has some issues with ozone gas, so you need to check with uh, the state where you live and make sure that if you are insulfating, with ozone, what the laws are in those states. 
Um, they don't prohibit the use of ozone, water, or saline, so you can use those. But for some reason, they have an issue with ozone gas. Um, if you do use ozone gas, you need to be very careful. It is a bronchial irritant, and patients are going to start coughing pretty violently if they get a good breath of that. Uh, of course, it's a PRF kit up there on the top. Um, if you're not using PRF, certainly recommend that. I'll discuss that in a minute. And on the bottom are some uh, homeopathics that we use also. Um, we infuse a socket uh, in each surgery. I also do it anytime I'm cleaning out the cavity and we ozone out the tooth. A um, few minutes as best as you can, as best you're able. If you've got a patient that's uh, difficulty to keep them breathing through their nose, they can go into a fit of coughing. You know, don't force it on them. Now, keep that suction really close. You're not trying to suck all the ozone out. You want it to penetrate in the bone. Ozone will penetrate about four to five millimeters of the bone. So I don't feel that you have to cut out four to five millimeters of bone around where that wisdom tooth was or where the root canal was because, of course, then you're taking out good bone. Let, let the ozone do the job for you. That stuff will penetrate in there, and it will help heal that bone up. And, of course, we irrigate with the ozone water or sterile saline. And I already talked about that last part there. PRF. Um, if you're not doing PRF, I certainly recommend that you uh, add this to your grocery list. You guys need to start doing this. You need to do it as quick as you can. Um, this is the easiest thing to get started in, uh, though it looks a little bit overwhelming at first. At dental school, they didn't teach me anything about doing venipuncture or blood draw. And you can take a little weekend class or you can go to the community college and they'll actually teach you how to do this. They teach high school kids how to do this. And you can learn how to do it. It's really not that hard. Now, saying that, don't pick someone to learn on and don't find somebody that has the hardest veins in the world to find. It, to find. Because you will want to go start drinking in the back office for the first patient if that's it. So you don't want to do that to yourself, okay? Um, I typically ask my patients, hey, um, how are your veins? Make sure they're good and hydrated. How are your veins? Well, you know, you have a problem giving blood, the phlebotomist, you know, they're taking it from your foot, you know, the back of your ankle, they're doing a jugular, what are they doing on you? And I'm really up front with patients. If they say, well, they never can't seem to get it, they've got to find this one that's way up under here, I'm not touching them. You know, and I've been doing this a couple of years. Um, some people are really good and they can get a vein almost everywhere. Um, I'm still working on that. That's okay. One patient at a time, right? So pick good patients. You know, learn how to do it. Let's see here. There you go. Um, avoid arms with histories of surgery. Um, also, um, the arm tattoos, sometimes that's a little bit more difficult to work around. Uh, I had a tattoo artist in the other day, and I was examining her arms for a venipuncture. And she was covered from... Uh, well, fingertip to, <laughs> I don't know where it went. I didn't ask. Um, uh, it was a little bit difficult. I was able to palpate the vein, but it, when you're starting out and you're trying to learn, you know, give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Try to find out. Um, of course, past, past surgery and stuff like that is going to be more difficult too. Um, any kind of amputation, they're not going to be using that arm the same. It's not going to have the same uh, vein structure as another arm that, that's being used. Um, as you increase the cases, of course, you get better. Um, some states allow the use of a phlebotomist or an assistant that's trained in phlebotomy to do this. I've gotten conflicting uh, answers in Texas, so right now I do it all. Um, if I can find where I can do it with an assistant that can do it all and save myself some headache and heartache, I probably will, but I haven't got there yet. Um, so this is a uh, an old, old older nurse, and I actually had to have her started at a nearby medical clinic because her veins were terrible, but she wanted that PRF. So we had to do a little bit of a work around there. Uh, the patient on the lower right uh, had, had multiple amputations for various reasons over the years. Her veins in that arm were total crap. She hardly ever used his hand, very rarely used anything. So again, that's going to be one of those things. You're going to need to look for these little things. Um, of course, then we have a centrifuge and a PRF cassette. Um, 
don't get a piece of crap. Don't get a piece of crap centrifuge off of eBay. Um, I've been, I've helped out some, some of our doctors that have tried this. Uh, you don't want something that's for horses that does the 60 cc vials. Um, you don't want anything that doesn't fit. Make sure your stuff fits. Uh, case in point, I went to help with a surgery with the PRF. And we got the blood draw. She didn't check to see if her vials fit in the little vial canister. So we took it out and slung blood all over ourselves. Patients looking around trying to figure out what we're doing. We're trying to recover. It looked like the Three Stooges. Um, then we went and put it in our centrifuge. She got off of eBay, and uh, the tubes didn't fit. They slid down in there and uh, turned the button on, and it slung blood all over the inside of the centrifuge, and it was a big mess. So uh, I but just trust me on this one. You don't want to do that. That was, uh, that was uh, a lot of cussing and actually, I think, two different languages that day. So um, <laughs> I learned some Russian. It was kind of interesting. Uh, that's not something you want to do. Um, Buy some that's, that's either pre-programmed or set up for, for a dental office or for PRF. Um, they are going to run you a little bit more money, but it's going to be a better quality machine. Uh, anything that's for veterinary science or something like that is not going to have quite the settings you're going to be needing. Um, and I'll show you some pictures of some of those that I have here. Also, uh, you're going to want to make sure that your tubes fit in your little barrels there. Uh, if they jam up in there, if you pull that sucker out, you're going to get covered. And that is not pretty. Uh, I will tell you that from experience. Um, centrifuges, uh, the, there are two different models. One is a bio PRF, which is a horizontal centrifuge. Uh, the downside of that is it only holds six tubes. Uh, the other ones that are available through uh, APRF, IPRF, uh, uh, they hold 12 tubes. Some even hold more than that. For larger surgeries, of course, you're going to be looking at that. I typically do uh, one plug per root plus one. So if I've got a three-rooted molar, I'm looking at four plugs. If there's some noticeable bone issues, I'm going to probably add a couple more plugs. Usually on one tooth, I'm going to be taking four to six tubes of blood. Okay. Now, if it's a little premolar or a canine or, uh, or even a incisor or maybe doing two to three plugs. Uh, you're going to have to get enough plugs you can balance your centrifuge and you're going to have to get enough plugs to uh, make sure you have enough material. Okay. When you do that, also look at their blood. If their blood's thick as mud, then you're probably going to want to get some extra tubes. If it's flowing real good, then, then you'll probably be all right with kind of ballparking those numbers. Uh, there's some tubes that spun down nicely. And, and then, of course, we open them up with the oxygen, and they, they set up, pull that plug out, and then we put them in the cassette here to press these. I do have some little videos of this if we got some time for that. Uh, you essentially set the weight down, and the weight is not very heavy, but it does press enough of that liquid out that you have a more condensed plug. It's easier to handle. You can mix this stuff with bone graft material. Uh, some doctors are really big on the cadaver bone. To me, that kind of gives me the willies still, so I don't like to get around that stuff too much. Most of the surgeries we do is with a straight PRF. Let's see if this is going to let me get it. There it goes. Okay, you asked about uh, MSA, meridian stress testing. Now we're going to ignore my little wheel here. Go away. Uh, meridian stress testing is going to work on the meridian system, and it's going to you can test the socket or the extraction site to see if the body energetically is, is free of anything that was insulting the body. Okay, So in this case, uh, we've got Mercedes Tristan. She is uh, trained on that, and she's testing the patient, testing on their, on their hand, the meridians that correspond with that socket. And I'm taking that spoon, and I'm pressing against each socket wall, you know, mesial, distal, uh, lingual, of each root so that she can test those to see if they've been cleaned out energetically enough to have that patient be satisfied that that's going to heal up. That that would be an ideal thing. It doesn't happen very often because she drives over from Houston about two and a half hours, so we have to special schedule that. Um, they are working on a simplified version of this, 
but currently MSA testing takes several years to learn how to do. It's just kind of a specialty. Uh, DNA testing, if you're not doing any DNA testing, it, it is an eye-opener. Eye I don't do it on every patient, but I do offer it to patients. And it's, it's really good if there's an area where a patient is struggling to find what in my tooth is causing me problems. This will come back with a list of the DNA bacteria of what junk is in that tooth. And these people are out here uh, today. You can talk to them after the break. Uh, this is really nice, especially like I said, if a patient's doctor just can't figure out where this bug is, where it's coming from, what it's at. You can give them a copy of this report and say, here's your, here's your load. This is what's going on. Uh, this case right here I had a patient whose daughter was a dentist. And uh, her daughter said, Mom, there's nothing wrong with that root canal. Uh, you just leave it in there. You don't need to have that taken, care, taken out. Uh, her other daughter is a naturopath and said, Mom, get that thing out of your face. It's bad for you. You're fighting cancer. So she was a little torn. Um, somehow the, the naturopath daughter found me and said, Hey, uh, I've got one for you. And I'm like, what you got? She said, my mom. I said, what do you mean about your mom? So she told me and... Uh, her daughter wouldn't take it out, which is good, because she probably wouldn't clean it out anyway. But we uh, did this report because uh, she needed something to, to let her daughter know she wasn't crazy. And uh, you can't refute stuff like that, folks. Those kind of numbers, that kind of bacterial load, got her cleaned up. Um, different bacteria had different teeth. Uh, one lady had a problem with the knee. It just wasn't healing up. Uh, we got rid of number... 11 and 12 on her that were root canal and uh, she was able to run around Disney with her grandkids and she opened and shut that part down three or four days in a row and she had this kind of junk in her mouth and of course they're not told it's in there so this is really good uh, another report and they're not all red some of them are just a, a mild load but personally I wouldn't want any of that crap in my body um, you got any questions? Uh, this is my office number. You just way to get a hold of me at 409-423-1300. And of course, email. That's going to go to my office manager because I'm terrible about checking my email address. Um, best way is, you know, hey, give us a call. Leave me a number. I can call you back and we can say, hey, yeah, let's talk about this. Um, I think I've got excuse me, a little bit of time. I can go back with some videos. Sure. Does it, anybody have any questions on? Yes, ma'am. Good question. How, where do you stop? Um, so going back a little bit with the curettes. That's a very good question. How do you stop? Where do you stop? Um, I stop. <laughs> Some patients, I, I've got a lot of rednecks um, that come in and uh, I've taken some teeth out and I've turned around and they're not in the chair anymore. They're sitting over there. You know, I'm like, wait a minute, what are you doing? I gotta clean that out. No, no, I'm done. So I mean if the patient says you're done, I mean, you know, you gotta kind of Yeah, I'm done. Um, you need to have sharp curettes. If you're using the same one, um, you know, for years and years and that thing's dull, you know, you have to get it sharpened, you're gonna have to get it get it checked to where that thing's actually gonna dig into the bone. You wanna clean that PDL up. Do you want to clean that PDL up until your your curettes are coming out clean? You may have some blood on them, but you're not having any more debris. And when you're getting down into these sockets where you have, let's see here, let's see if I can get to that slide. Sorry. Um, here's going. So in this area right here. Uh, the one on the right, there's a lot of granulation tissue in there. That's going to be really hard just to get in a spoon and get that out. Sometimes you're going to just get kind of poking around at that, which is why I recommend one of those serrated spoons. So you can just dig into that thing and just start pulling it out. Sometimes you'll have to get some hemostats down in there, grab a hold of that thing and pull it out. Um, sometimes it'll come out in, in one big piece. Sometimes it'll be lots of little pieces. And then you're going to go back in and you're going to clean that with the curettes until you can get that socket good and clean kind of in all directions. Um, then I irrigate everything out and I, I do go back and check again. And you're going to really kind of apply a lot of pressure. Yes, sir. Uh, 
That, that, that's, that's a good point. So he insulates with uh, with ozone gas, um, kind of intermittently through the surgery, and that what that does is that helps kind of break some of that stuff up, and that, and that does help a lot. Um, also irrigation a lot, making sure that you're washing this stuff out because you want to keep cleaning the stuff. And you know, it's, every time I clean it out, I have my my assistant suction my spoon off. I'm you know I'm looking at the spoon when they're cleaning that off. I'm not going right back in there, and then I'm going down each wall and making sure that I'm getting that good and clean until that spoon comes out to where you're not seeing any more granulation tissue or any kind of tissue on that thing. Okay, good question. Um, when you're in the sinus, um, so to me, sinus membrane looks a little bit different. Uh, I'm very careful when I'm in the sinus. I'm going to do most of my curatage and cleaning on the sidewalls and I'm not going to be you know dangling up in the in the socket I'm going to be using a lot of uh, ozone which you can be very careful you know if, if you're doing ozone you've got a sinus communication you can make sure the patient's going to be breathing through their mouth and not taking a good deep breath into their nose because otherwise they're going to start coughing all over the place um, if you are irrigating oftentimes I'm going to have the patient sit up to where it's going to come back down through the hole um, I actually had a case one time where we were extracting a tooth and the roots went up in the sinus and I took a pan on like where did those go and he was laying back on his back and they were way up in there I'm like you know that's one of those old crap moments um, so we get all three roots out by sitting them up irrigating and suctioning the force of the water and the suction pulled all the roots right back out the socket so um, you know if you ever get one of those old crap moments you might try that trick it may, may save you a little bit um, but yeah, oftentimes sitting them up changes the position uh, to make sure that you get that. When you cure it, um, of course, you're not going to have a whole lot of junk in the sinus. Um, but when you start getting into the sinus, there's junk that's up in there. You're kind of crossing into that that line where ENT probably needs to be handling some of that. So I just I'd be real careful. And then in those cases where I do have a sinus communication, I always inform the patient of that. I document where it was, and then I put the PRF plugs in there. And then I'm going to be sewing those kind of together so that they don't, you know, go up in the sinus. I'll be sewing those together and then sewing those down to where they're not going to be going anywhere. So, yeah, um, lower teeth, uh, really, really good question also. When you're curating, especially around that inferior alveolar canal, you're just going to be really careful as far as where you're at. Um, oftentimes there's a little bit of a bone floor. I'm not going to apply so much pressure and go through that floor. I'm going to be very careful with that. Yes, sir. Um, back up right now, I, I am using a little bit of the Helio Plugs or Collar Plugs. It's collagen based. Um, I use some of that sometimes. There's a new synthetic that just was FDA, I think, approved is the terminology I'm looking for. I, I don't trust the FDA anymore, but. Um, it's through the bio bio PRF people. It's os, osteopia or osteopia or something like that. It's a uh, beta trip, beta tricalcium phosphate. I give patients options. Um, I try to be open minded. I try to give them options. Um, I do have some patients that are working with another specialist for an implant, and they insist on cadaver bone. I'm like, okay. I mean, if you insist, it's your body, and I'll I'll, I'll try to do that mixed with PRF. If you draw off the PRF before it sets and you mix the, your bone graft material or your cadaver bone with that and let it set in the bowl, then it's a lot easier to handle and you do get the benefits from the PRF also. And then I do like a you know condensed PRF plug on top and then suture everything. I've switched to a uh, polyglycolic acid suture now, PGA suture, which is about a three week preservable. I was doing nylon for people for a while. Getting someone to drive three hours, three hours, come back and see me for a suture removal, I thought was a little bit uh, upsetting to them. So that's why I switched mainly to that, that, that PGA suture. But good question as far as that. We Sometimes you can't get blood, and it's really frustrating. And I try to communicate that with patients ahead of time, that we do have some options. It's not my favorite, but uh, unfortunately, sometimes you can't, can't pick what you can do. You can just do what you can do. Um, and the thing about the curating, um, when you're curating the socket, you're going to clean that out as best you can. 
but also what the patient will allow you to do. I've got some patients that are pretty anxious and you know they'll let me clean the socket out, but but to a certain point, and they're like, okay, you got to stop. You know, I'll, I'll stop. You know, even they've been numb so much they can't feel anything, they're still aware of that pressure. You know, I'm not going to force someone to go through something, but I do document that. You know, socket cleaned out as best as patient will allow. And that's, that's make sure that's in my notes. Because if it comes back, you know, five years down the road, like, hey, you know, the socket doesn't look good. Why, why didn't you clean out that socket, Dr. Sessions? I'm going to look at that and be like, oh, well, they wouldn't let me. Oh, they wouldn't? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's the guy that got up out of the chair and was leaving the operatory before I put the tooth down to see what was coming out of his mouth. So some people are like that. You just got to do the best you can with what you've got. Do I prescribe antibiotics? Um, I do to some degree. I'm trying to get away from those as much as I can. I, I see that we've got a lot of population right now that is so sold on antibiotics that it's going to fix everything, and then everybody is so worried about getting something else somewhere else that they are almost insistent on it. I, I try to avoid it as much as I can. A lot of it's going to depend on the patient and their health. Even with PRF, if you've got a patient, their health is just pure crap. I mean, you're going to pretty much have to throw the whole medicine cabinet at them, and that's what we do. Um, I am really recommending a lot of the, the, the vitamin D and the supplements if they can find them. Some of the stores have been sold out of the vitamin D and, and vitamin C stuff, but that's really good for post-op. All right. Thank you all.